Bill's third lecture. <clears throat> so thank you. Let me summarize what I've been talking about before. So the um, theme is to study the ways of putting a classical geometry that is a, a geometry of a homogeneous space, such as Euclidean space, the sphere, hyperbolic space, projective space, sphere with conformal geometry and many other geometries on a um, topology, which will usually be a smooth manifold, but it can just be an arbitrary manifold. And the point of view it, that I want to take will be that a, a geometry will be a space X of points where there is a lead group G that's acting transitively on it. So every point is taken to every other by some element of the group. And this is the Erlangen program of Felix Klein in 1872, which gives a way of classifying geometries in terms of lead groups and lead actors. The um, notion of geometric structure that I want to describe was first described by Charles Ariston in the 1930s. And if we start with a manifold with just some topology, let's say a smooth manifold, then we can imagine covering the manifold by coordinate patches, that call U, indexed by alpha, mapping into X, such that on the components of the intersection, there's a transformation taking one coordinate description to another. And so I thought this should be called an Ariston structure, since this is, a, in this generality, this notion is Charles Ariston. This point of view was um, um, renewed in the late 1970s by Bill Thurston, who phrased his geometrization conjecture that every three-dimensional manifold can be decomposed canonically into geometric pieces. So by a geometric piece, one means that the three-dimensional space is locally modeled on a three-dimensional homogeneous Riemannian manifold, such as the three-sphere Euclidean space or hyperbolic space. In dimension two, every surface has a um, spherical structure with the Euler characteristic is positive, and that's the closed surfaces that's just a two-sphere projective plane. The Euclidean structure, if the um, Euler characteristic is zero, that includes the torus and the fine bottle, and every surface of genus greater than one has a hyperbolic structure. The situation in dimension three is much more complicated because one has to um, decompose the surface, the three manifold along two spheres and tori, to, to, but once you decompose this in a canonical way, the um, pieces have geometric structures. And there are eight different three-dimensional homogeneous geometries. So I just, and then this um, conjecture was proved recently by Perelman. He's an analytic technique. So I won't say too much about this, except that um, these are, are um, this is, uh, Thurston's theory led to renewed interest in the subject in the 1970s. So what I'd like to do in today's talk is to describe more of the different kinds of geometries and mainly just give a lot of examples. And so the basic question is given a topology and a geometry, what are the different possible ways of providing it? And I think the familiar example I keep alluding to is that the sphere doesn't have a Euclidean structure. No metrically accurate or allows. On the other hand, the whole the true torus has lots of Euclidean structures. And this picture here is an illustration of what the geometry the, the space of Euclidean structures itself has an interesting geometry, and that's hyperbolic geometry. So let me describe that first. Is this visible to the 
Okay, so if you have a Euclidean structure on the torus, as I mentioned in the first lecture, we can understand the topology of the torus by decomposing the torus along two curves. I'm gonna call, I'll call this the A curve, and this one I'll call the B curve. And then the torus is realized topologically as an identification space where the A curves are identified, and the B curves are identified. These correspond to alternate sides of the quadrilateral. The, ladder. the um, by laying out the coordinate charts on the manifold, so we might start at the vertex, the vertex of coordinate, like this, one of them will look like that, and then we start continuing the coordinate charts around. As you say, go around the A loop, for example, you might get a sequence of coordinate patches mapped in by the coordinate charts, but they may not close up. You may get a different the coordinate, the composition of the coordinate chains will take you from here over to here, and this will correspond to what's called the holonym around the loop. And in the example that I gave, this would just be a translation. So it's similar, so this is actually, this would be, sorry, correctly, this should be, this, okay, you can reverse, this is, this is the A curve. Well, there's a nice theory, which I think Jack will probably be describing later in the course, but the upshot will be that um, every structure on the torus can be realized as a <coughs> parallelogram with its opposite edges identified by translations. And as I mentioned yesterday, this corresponds to choosing a lattice, so we have the group generated by two translations. Beta, these are vectors. One or two. And then the lattice will correspond to all the integer linear combinations of these vectors. And we can think of the original torus, the manifold M, as being a quotient of the Euclidean plane. Let me we'll call it R2, but we want to think of now the R2 as being a group and a quotient group as subgroup. So the R2 now will be just the vector space spanned by alpha and beta and alpha and beta form the basis. So for example, the lattice could just be the integer, ordinary integer lattice and classes of points in the plane or two points that are equivalent if their difference is an integer point. Okay, so how do you classify these things? Well, we need to know what we want to classify them up to. And one thing we want to classify them up to is Euclidean isometry. So that means that we would say that two lattices would be equivalent if there is an isometry taking one to the other. And you quickly realize that if you do that, then there's a nice invariant you get, which is the total area. Okay. And if you scale the lattice, then that, if you say, replace lambda by r lambda, where r is a, say, non-zero real number, then the area be r squared times the area of that, that image of the original. So the first invariant to use to classify Euclidean structures on the torus, that is ways of putting Euclidean geometry on this 
for us is to um, consider the area. And by applying one of these similarity transformations, these dilations that I discussed yesterday, we can assume that the area is one, or we can fix the area. So there are two ways of proceeding. Either we fix the area and look at isometry classes, or we enlarge the equivalence relation to look at Euclidean structures up to similarity. But either one will work. And so we can assume classification problem that the say the area is one. Or enlarge the equivalence relation. So that's the first reduction. Second reduction will be to take the last take. So, as I indicated here, one of the translations will <coughs> correspond to A, and the other translation will correspond to B. So, if we started with our base chart here, and then start took a succession of coordinates. Patches the B curve. Then, as we go around the B curve, so that would say would be starting down here, we would get a translation corresponding to the B direction. And that would be another basis, all those basis. So we have a basis of R2 corresponding to A and B, but they're labeled by A and B. This is called a marking. very useful extra piece of structure where we keep track of the topology of the surface. So we have well-defined vectors, alpha and beta, which correspond to the translations, corresponding Classify them. Well, the condition that the area is one would be that normalization. That's just the statement that the determinant of the matrix whose columns are alpha and beta equals one. For example. Well, now. Have a pair of vectors alpha and beta, we can um, apply a rotation. If I if I use the if if I use the con convention that I'm only looking at area one lattices, I won't specify the length of beta. In that case, the um, alpha will be some vector in the upper half. Well, some vector which is not. So alpha and beta are going to be linearly independent over the real. So it's not. Since I'm not keeping track of the orientation, I can assume also 
this way I get a point in the upper half line. would be not to normalize the area, but to allow scalings. And here, if I allow scalings, I could assume the beta now is the unit vector. If I alternately, um, enlarge the equivalence relation and say similarities, I can assume scale beta had unit you know, length to be horizontal. horizontal. And then and I can assume that alpha is also a beta on the upper half. So a marked Euclidean structure. Natural geometry <coughs> on this space of geometries is hyperbolic geometry. So, you say, what I mean by that? So, we made a choice throughout all of this. And the point in the upper half plane is usually denoted by. You have, if you chose a different basis for the fundamental group, a different basis, another, another labeling of alpha and beta. So maybe instead of taking alpha and beta, A and B to be the curves that wrap around like this, maybe you take the curve that goes around one of them one time, the other one several times, like the curve on the torus that you get by looking at a slope that's not one or infinity, one dimensional one one curve of slope one, you're all infinity. Then <coughs> you would get a new alpha and beta, A and B, or yeah, that would give rise to a new alpha and beta. And they would be related by an integer matrix. This would correspond to changing the mark, changing the labeling of the two elements, alpha and beta, I used to decompose the torus. And I'll leave it as an exercise for you to check that the new invariant you get in the upper half plane will be obtained by a linear fractional transformation. In this way. And that's what this picture here represents. This is the upper half plane. And this is a fundamental domain for the action of the group of integer linear fractional transformations on this. So if you don't look at the marking, if you don't label the curves on the surface, then you can think of this triangle here in the upper half plane as being a model for this space. And the collection of transformations preserves the Poincaré metric. And so there's a natural hyperbolic geometry metric, which will be lives on the space of Euclidean structures. So this is maybe all I want to say about the general theory, but this is one way of saying that this is a very rich subject, that the space of geometries itself has an interesting geometry. I'll give some more examples later. Maybe we could explain this a little. 
Are there any questions about this? The next example that I'd like to give so is an illustration in projective geometry. And projective geometry doesn't involve any distance, it's just incidence between points and lines. So here's a nice exercise you can do over a spring break. children and you want to show them some interesting mathematics that they can do just with a straight edge. So this is not a straight edge and compass, but just a straight edge. Here's a way of generating an interesting picture. I'll show you the picture. I'm going to tell you better start here. Here's the picture. So this is a tessellation of a triangle, of a big triangle, but lots and lots of little triangles. And there are going to be projective transformations that are reflections in, in these triangles. And this tessellation will look very familiar. So, so what does this tessellation look like combinatorially? Have you seen it before? You know, Euclidean geometry? So in Euclidean geometry, what are ways of tiling the Euclidean plane? We talked, a lot, we talked about one at great length handling it by squares. The quotient will be a torus. It's a crystallographic group. You could also take the square and divide it into triangles on your areas and get an isosceles right triangle. What other tiles can you use for triangles to tile the plane? Equilateral. Lateral triangles are nice because the, the, the angles are 60 degrees. And if you look at a reflection in one side of the equilateral triangle, you get another one. Another one. And then you take this triangle and start reflecting it more and more. And you see that there are going to be six triangles around the circle in this tessellation. Is that true for the picture here? Combinatorially, it's the same picture, except this is now fitting inside one triangle of the plane rather than filling up the whole Euclidean plane. Okay, so let me describe how you might draw this. So, any suggestions? <coughs> Claim that once you have this starting configuration, everything else is determined. And so there are two rules. <coughs> one every interior point, actually have two interior points, to every vertex, three vertices. And whenever two lines intersect, mark that point. So let's join these two points to this vertex. We've done, we're not done because now these two points are not connected to the original vertex. So we join them. And in doing that, we create a whole bunch 
if you're doing this with a straight edge, then you'll discover that this line here comes and intersects this point here. So that's a co coincidence, and at this stage, you're going to see lots and lots of coincidences. And this is a way of generating, just with a straight edge and a pencil, this tessellation. So this is an example of a geometric structure, in a way. This is not on a manifold, but it's on a more general object called a monopole, which you probably until after spring grad career Jack to tell you about. Does it matter where on the original like first line of symmetry the thread is supposed to point from? No, it doesn't. And in fact, there's going to be an invariant. In fact, these can be there's a moduli space just like there is a space of Euclidean structures on the torus. <coughs> and this is going to be determined by the cross ratio of four points. So remember the starting configuration. Again, I'm leaving Jack many things to explain after spring break. That you have four points on a projective line, there's a natural projectively invariant quantity called the cross ratio, which is going to be like the distance between these two points, projective distance inside the triangle. And so if we vary that, we get varying families. So maybe I should write this down. If you have coordinates, um, you can find for a linear fractional transformation so that this say has coordinate zero, this has coordinate infinity, this has coordinate one, and then this Ratio. And it's given by a, a function. Let me see if I can remember if you're 50 or centers x or w, it will be something like y minus x divided by y minus Check that if you take a linear fractional transformation like this and apply it to all four of these variables, that this number stays the same. So let's see what happens when you vary this. So now, we, here's the, the first one I drew. Now we're going to take a slightly smaller cross ratio. So these two points are a little bit closer together. So forth and so on. You get the same picture coming the photo. It's finer and finer. What happens in the limit? Well, the limit seems to fill up all of space, all of the triangle, and I don't really want that to happen. So I'd like to renormalize by making the triangle bigger and bigger and keeping the original smaller triangle approximately the same size. So rather than do this construction, I'll start with this triangle, and now apply a tr projective transformation that expands everything, including moving these three lines further and further out. So that takes this triangle. So we're keeping the approximate size of the original starting triangle the same. What do you think this approach is? Exactly. So the three lines that were scaling that are forming the boundary of this triangle, <coughs> the three lines that are scaling to give the, the boundary of the triangle are becoming more and more coincident, or not, they're not becoming more and more coincident, but they're getting further and further apart, and eventually they're going to be at infinity. And they're going to be like three lines parallel to the side of the Euclidean. of projective structures on this triangle. If you, um, this is an example of a crystal graphic group. And the theorem of Biebervoort that I said yesterday, I said yesterday, applies 
And if you, the group generated by reflections on the sides of the equilateral triangle contains a subgroup of index six, I believe, which will be a group of translations. A nice exercise is to find translations, express certain products of reflections in the sides of this triangle. Find products of reflections on the sides of the triangle, which are going to be your two linearly independent translations. So you see a lattice, so this will be an extension of the three abelian group of two translations by a group of order six. But that applies to all of these transformations as well. Um, so this is one example. Now, we have some examples that are more complicated, which are going to correspond to hyperbolic geometry. But I want to give another family of examples of abelian groups first and Euclidean structures. Okay, so at the end of the lecture, I'll describe hyperbolic geometry on surfaces of higher genus where you decompose along a curve like this. This is a pattern of identification that will correspond to tessellations of the hyperbolic plane. There will be two of them, but I will discuss this in detail. But I'd like to delay that and instead talk about some more examples of affine structures. <coughs> so I talked about an affine structure yesterday. And in affine geometry, we have, we lose the metric, but we keep track of parallelism. <coughs> and it's the transformations that preserve parallelism are just the linear transformation and the translations. So an affine transformation <coughs> is something that just looks like AX plus B where A is just a linear transformation. It's a Euclidean isometry. If and only if A is an orthogonal matrix. But in general, most matrices aren't orthogonal. And we saw that this that already you could get some pretty weird examples of geometric structures with this notion of parallelism, even on the torus. If I identify the sides of the curve of geometric angles by that identification I2, one obtains a torus, which has the property that curves of zero acceleration can be can be extended. Geodesically incomplete. So I'm not going to talk about any of those pathologies, but I'd like to say something about how you can get some fairly <coughs> bizarre structures just on torus. Or, and this is it leads to some more interesting. <coughs> so First of all, is that all Euclidean structures are affinely equivalent on the two points of torus. Okay. The Bieberbach theorem, or the theorem that I mentioned earlier, I mean, it just states that um, all the structures are given by different lattices. So one structure will be R2 bottom of the lattice, the other one will be R2 on a different lattice. <coughs> and the lattices are just the um, groups generated by bases. There's a basis of lambda, basis of lambda prime. And what the analysis that we did before to get the upper half plane was by taking the basis and mapping by normalizing the basis by applying reflections and rotations. So we have different bases up to orthogonal transformations. But if we're interested in equivalents up to affine transformations, for example, similarities, which we 
also discussed. How many different bases are there up to an affine change? So all of these different tori corresponding to the long, thin rectangles or parallelograms that are not very far from being rectangles, parallelograms. They're all going to be affine the equivalent, even though they may have different area, they may have different lengths, the curves, they may have different angles. So there's only one up to affine equivalent. And so the picture that I've drawn here is just the pixel lattice that we quotient by to get a torus. And now what I'd like to do is to start bending the lattice in a different way to obtain, so here's a different lattice, a different tessellation by parallelograms. And I'd like to change it to give different affine structures that are affinely different. Now, I'll write down a formula that I think is more elegant to describe a homeomorphism of the plane that takes this tessellation to this tessellation here. So the curves here are not straight lines, of course. These are parabolas. And you can imagine that these parabolas are all, there are two parallel families of these parabolas. How would you get different affine structures? So we have, we, if you take two lattices of translations, we just saw that they're all going to be affine equivalent. So different lattices of translations aren't going to be good. You need to do something besides take translations. Okay, so what's a translation? Let me give you some notation. Translation, I'll call it tau sub m n. Translation by m n. So that will take point x y <coughs> x plus m. I'll only consider the integer translations. And now, if I take a homeomorphism of the plane to itself, I can use that to change the coordinate system to give them. And most of the time, if I conjugate by a homeomorphism, I'll get something which is not going to be a translation at all. So let's take a homeomorphism of the following. Let's take f of x, y to be a um, quadratic transform. Is that a homeomorphism? First of all, is it continuous? I'm sure, it's a polynomial. Is it invertible? Is it bijective? What's its inverse? Well, if this is equal to x prime, y prime, well, then what's, how do you solve for x and y in terms of x prime and y prime? Well, x is equal to x prime, so that means that x is equal to x prime, and y, well, that's equal to y prime minus x <coughs> squared, which is y prime minus x prime squared. So the inverse homomorphism <coughs> of x prime y prime will just be x prime Because 
x stays x is unchanged, and y is changed only depending on x. By the addition of the square. The remarkable thing about this polynomial is that it conjugates translations to um, airplane transformations. <laughs> and that's exactly what this picture here represents. It takes the original lattices, the lattice that I included. So let's go back to the first picture, which is the rectangular <coughs> lattice. And now I apply that homeomorphism f, and I get this picture here. <coughs> now the translations that are identifying the left to the right and the top to the bottom are going to be represented by new homeomorphisms, which actually turn out to be affine transformations. And if you take a lattice that doesn't have a horizontal or vertical basis vector, then you get tessellations like this. So let's see what happens. Let's do a little calculation. So let's take f, compose tau, and then composed f inverse. Let's change coordinates by this polynomial transformation and see what happens. First step is to is to take to apply f inverse to x y. So that's going to replace that by x y minus x squared. Now I translate. So I have x plus m y minus x squared plus m formula for the translation. And finally, I apply f. So I have undone f here. I've applied f inverse, so now I undo f inverse by applying f. So the first coordinate in f stays the same, so it's just, so far it looks just like a translation. And now the second coordinate is more interesting. We take, take y, which is now replaced by this complicated expression. And I subtract off x plus m quantity squares. And now look what happens. The quadratic terms cancel. Why are, are we subtracting in the, in the last calculation? Because that's. Oh, I should add. I should add. I should add. Thanks. Okay. Didn't do that on purpose. Okay, so, so now this is conjugating this translation by a quadratic diffeomorphism. <coughs> okay, and so, so I expand this out. I have x squared plus 2m x plus m squared. And I finally get x plus m minus y. The quadratic terms are in x and y are cancel out using the x squared. And then if I rearrange, I have y squared y plus 2m x squared plus m. So the linear part of this affine transformation is one, which is going to this to x, y. So I have x plus m, so I have one term. So now I have uh, two m here, two m x, one. So the translational part is m. This gives rise to an exotic affine structure for two toys. I'll show you what these things look like. We take an order, just a Euclidean structure, a lattice, and then we change coordinates by this quadratic diffeomorphism. Take a more interesting lattice, which is equivalent to the first one by an affine transformation. And now when I apply f, I get something that looks completely different, but it's still good. Tessellation by parabolas. And with some more work, you can show that the moduli space of these is, is actually the plane in a much different, in a much different way. So in the case of hyperbolic, in the case of the hyperbolic geometry. So, are there any questions about this? So, maybe I'll just mention that the classification of this is due to Kuiper and later Oliver Bowes in 
and the fact that the space that you get marked structures is homeomorphic to R2 is interesting, but then the action of the, the, when you, the change of marking GL2Z, the linear transformations now are acting linearly on R2. It's a much different action than the action on the upper half point by linear fractional transformation. That leads to some very interesting dynamical chaotic behavior. Okay, so fine, let me <coughs> close with a description of hyperbolic geometry. Let me show another one of my favorite examples of a geometric structure. Okay, so, so let's look at this surface here. So now we'll look at the surface of GL2. Now we're going to cut it along a more, it's a more complicated surface, so we have to cut it along a more complicated system of curves. So instead of just having an A curve and a B curve, now we have two A curves and two B curves. And when we can decompose it, this thing falls into an octagon with a, a similar kind of identification. So that describes the topology. So points have, there are again three types of points. There are points that lie off this dissection pattern, and those correspond to points in the interior of the octagon. They have neighborhoods which are disks embedded inside the octagon. Then there are points that are on the curves in the dissection pattern. And they will correspond to points on the interiors of the edges of the octagon. Each one of these points will be identified to a partner. In the octagon, these points have half disk neighborhoods, and the half disk neighborhoods get identified to full disks. And finally, we have the most interesting point, which is the vertex, this point here, which falls into eight images. So under this identification, all eight of the vertices are identified to a single point. And what is a neighborhood of this point? Well, it corresponds to neighborhoods of each of the vertices in the original octagon. So in this picture here, this is a Euclidean octagon. What's the angle in a Euclidean octagon? So an octagon is a, can be decomposed into five triangles, and each triangle has high radians. And then when you identify in Euclidean space the um, angles, you don't get 2 pi, but you get 5 pi worth of angles going around here. So you get a rather strange looking geometric structure. You get a Euclidean structure on all of the surface, but uh, there's an awful lot of angle at this, at this point here. And this has been a these surfaces have been studied extensively in type number theory and complex analysis, dynamics. They're called translation surfaces, and they're an important class of Riemann surfaces. But I don't want to really go in that direction. I want to go into the direction of hyperbolic geometry. So let's see if we can put a nice geometry on this surface of genus 2 by putting this in a different geometry. Now, in order to do that, I want a neighborhood of the vertex to have be a cone of cone angle two pi, and there are going to be <coughs> eight of these angles. So we have two pi divided by eight pi over four, which is forty five degrees. So I'd like to be able to build a, a regular octagon which has angles forty five degrees. <coughs> so here's a way of doing it. Now, I, I, one of the reasons I like this picture is that it involves some hyperbolic graph paper. So let's look at this little triangle here for a moment. So what are the angles in this triangle? So this, this is in the Poincaré model where the angles are preserved. This is the conformal model. So there are 16 triangles that go around this vertex here. So this angle here is pi divided by A. 
How much, what's the angle here? At this vertex, there are four triangles. The total angle is 2 pi, so the angle is pi over 2. It's a right, it's a right angle. triangles and the total angle to go around is 2 pi so it's pi over 4 so these are the, are the angles in the triangle and if you have three angles that add up to less than pi then you can build a triangle in hyperbolic space with those as the angles okay and so let's take that angle and just and now imagine doing the same procedure we did before, like right? looking at the, the group of transformations obtained by reflecting in the sides of the triangle. So starting with this triangle here, we reflect over this side here, we get a triangle here. We reflect over this side here, we get a triangle here. And if we reflect in this side, we get a triangle here. And we keep going, we get a tile in the entire hyperbolic plane. And now, what are the angles here? So let's not just go out one step from the center, but let's go out two steps along one of these lines. These, this is, this is, here we have pi over eight, so we'll have pi over four. So we have what we want. We have, a, we have an octagon, a regular octagon, and these sides are the same. The angles are the same too, and the angles are 45 degrees. And now, yes, that's what I wanted to see. We want to be able to realize these identifications geometrically. So we want to take this topology coming from here and map it into the hyperbolic plane by this triangle. And we want to realize these identifications so I didn't indicate the orientations, but as we saw with the Klein bottle, it's very important to indicate how we're identifying this edge to this edge. And that's not drawn in the picture, but we want to do that in a way that will preserve the orientation. So I really should have put little arrows to indicate that this vertex here is being taken to this vertex here, and this vertex here is taken to this vertex here. But now it's a theorem in hyperbolic geometry that if you have two oriented line segments of the same length, then there's a unique orientation preserving isometry taking one to the other. So this edge here has the same length as this edge here. So there's a transformation that takes this to this. And that transformation can be realized actually as a product of reflections in the sides of the this was a project of a student of mine did in the experimental geometry lab. She was given, we had worked out the <coughs> triangle tessellation for her, and rather than going through the calculations of real matrices and linear fractional transformations, working at a high level, she was, was able to find the um, ways of drawing the um, octagon that was a union of the triangle. So you can compute the area, for example, because by counting the number of triangles inside the bigger octagon. Now I was interested in this for another reason, because I was interested in putting singularities and messing up the hyperbolic structure. And for that, I wanted to look at another triangle, another octagon that's built on the same piece of hyperbolic graph paper, namely the one that's given by right angle. So it's the same tessellation given by a triangle that has angles, a right angle, 45 degree angle, and pi over 8 radian angle. So now observe that we also have an octagon that has eight right angles. And once again, we can take the pattern of identifications. So 
the right orientations on the edges. And then observe that now this edge can be identified to this edge, this edge can be identified to this edge, and we get a structure on the surface. But what's the geometry on the surface? Now the problem is that we have eight right angles going around this point here, and that corresponds to a hyperbolic structure on the surface that has a cone point where the cone is of four pi radians. Okay, so this gives rise to an interesting <coughs> theory in a moduli space with these singularities. And I'll stop here. This is an example of some that illustrate how a risk subject is. Geometry on surfaces is. So, thank you very much. Thank you.